This is the third Sunday in Lent as we continue in this series of reflections on how we practice our prayer. What I share today in my sermon may be nothing to you at all. You may think at the end of this, well, that's obvious. But it wasn't obvious to me, apparently. It's a lesson that I needed to learn, and it's a deeply meaningful thing that I'm learning it for myself, especially over this past year. This past year has been one of the hardest, yet one of the most meaningful teachers I have ever had. The lesson I am learning has everything to do with seeing your entire life as a prayer. First, let me tell you another story about my grandfather, my dad, or the extraordinary man who I've told you about who was wounded outside Bologna in World War II, and who in his old age became a world-class tinkerer. As I get older, Dadder becomes even more of a role model for me, someone whose way of living encourages me to reflect on my own life, the way I live in my own days. Dadder lived simply, wasting nothing. He once replaced a tire on his push mower with one that he pulled off an old tricycle that someone had tossed in the dumpster down the road from their house. So for the longest time, we would stand there. I would stand next to my grandmother washing dishes in the kitchen sink, and we'd look out the window and see him push mowing the front yard with one of the tires covered in a sort of red and white peppermint stripe. Any plant or rooting that he stuck in the ground would sprout, including this incredible, wild-looking red and yellow chrysanthemum that he stuck in a broken barbecue grill turned planter that he kept on the patio. When I think of Dadder, I think of a solid, grounded life that was well-lived, simple, balanced, and realistic. Seasoned by the pain of war in his 20s, he never took life for granted and he never missed an opportunity to tell his family that he loved us. Interestingly now, as I look back, I see that there was actually a deep intention to the way that he lived his life. There was a structure there, and he made choices about what he would spend his time on and what he considered a priority. Even though he lived simply, he did not live aimlessly or flippantly. I learned from Dadder and am learning still that it takes conscious work to nurture a simple and grounded life. Dadder made choices about what he felt was important to spend time on, and making choices means that you must say no to some things in order to say yes to others. I know we've all been challenged this year. I think of my fellow parents, especially being taken out of our normal routines with school and activities and sent to our homes. We have realized that the adage, it takes a village to raise a child, is very true. When we lose our wider support structure, like teachers, coaches, piano and gymnastics instructors, and troop leaders, and we find ourselves working with our kids on projects and doing math that has more letters in it than actual numbers. It has been stressful, and I only hope that we come to appreciate all the people in that wider village that are helping us raise our children when we get on the other side of this. Maybe we will never look at teachers the same way again. Maybe we'll appreciate them more, or physicians and nurses, or grocery workers. I think about the choices that were taken from us, as it were, during these days and the other choices we struggled to make. I think of the older members of the parish with health concerns who took on the lives of hermits in many ways. Just last week, I was talking on a Zoom call with my friend Father Garrick from Mepkin Abbey outside of Charleston, who said, the pandemic has made Trappists of all of us. 
We have all tested the waters of a more cloistered life, and we have all seen and been challenged in an awareness of how we are invited to make choices. We've all been challenged to become more conscious of how we live in these days. And the loss of routines and demands has shifted our perspectives about many things. We've also seen such experiences of God's grace in these days. And the opportunity has actually given us a remarkable choice that we all share. And it's a chance to re-evaluate, restructure, and realign our lives along trajectories of, of simplicity, balance, and groundedness. We have had to make choices, and perhaps we see how our choices have consequences. Like my grandfather, he purposefully chose to live a simple life, and I learned from him that simple does not mean easy. Saying no to the stress and the busyness meant that he had more time to spend with us, time to support us, time to work in the garden and grow food, time to live in a way that gave him joy, time to teach me how to drive in an old brown Chevy pickup truck down the dirt logging roads. He said no to busyness and he said no to getting caught up in having to have the shiniest and newest thing. He had no interest in keeping up with the Joneses, as it were. He would bring them fresh tomatoes that he grew in his own garden, and that brought him joy. Dadder structured his days intentionally, just as we are being invited to do, not just during this year, but actually at any moment, at every moment of our lives. This conscious structuring of our life is what we call discernment, making decisions that are rooted in an awareness of God's presence and guidance. In order to do this, in order to nurture such an intentional life, the wisdom of our Christian tradition that we share with other faiths is that we need a framework, some form of a faithful boundary that lays out a pattern of where to walk, how to stand, and how to act in life. We see such a call to an intentional life in so many of the Psalms. Like in Psalm, 20, in Psalm 86, in this portion of it, where it says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. With well, this portion from Psalm 25, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. We're reminded that our practice of faith is so often understood as a path. And on paths, you have to learn where to step and where not to. As they were journeying in the wilderness for so long, Moses realized that the Hebrew people were going to need structure to nurture their practice of faith. They weren't only wandering physically. They needed holy boundaries to help them discern how they should live and how they should act. That realization is the deep wisdom of what we call the Ten Commandments. These are not mere rules to follow. Rather, they are a deep wisdom teaching steeped in the awareness that we need a holy framework, something that helps us make conscious decisions about life, something that helps us discern. Don't step here, step there. I believe that so many of the 10 are framed in the negative because we are human and so often fall short and miss the mark. We call that sin. It's like when our kids were first able to walk around the house and needed guidance on how to move in this world. Don't step there, step here. When they first reached for an outlet or a cord plugged in the wall, we didn't sit them down at age two and explain the physics of electricity to them. We told them, don't touch that outlet. 
as they grew in their wisdom, they built off of that instruction of where to step and where not to step. The Ten Commandments offer us such guidance on how to walk the path of our practice of faith. There are infinite ways of loving your neighbor, but let's start by agreeing not to kill them. That feels like a good bottom line to start with. There are infinite ways to share a friendly relationship with others in your community, but let's agree not to steal their stuff or their spouse. There are infinite ways of honoring God, of showing our devotion to God, but first, we must set out the boundary that it will be God alone whom we worship. That means, in order to say yes to this worship of God, we are saying no to the temptation of worshiping anything or anyone else. And that includes all the stuff of life that the wider culture wants to convince us is so important. And it includes anyone, anyone, who acts as though we must worship them. Our loyalty is to God alone. The guardrails help us manage the path before us. Friends, this is why Jesus got so angry in the temple that day and turned over the tables that we read about in our gospel lesson. He got so angry because the temple authorities had taken wrong steps on the path when it came to the intersection of cultural norms around money and the call to worship God alone. Jesus was saying it shouldn't take that many steps to convert this type of coin into that type of coin with, of course, some taking a cut of interest along the way in order to give your offering to share in God's loving kingdom. It shouldn't be that complicated. Jesus flipped the tables over to shake them out of the illusion. Like a great Zen master, Jesus, the spiritual teacher, was waking them up and challenging them to see the point that we are called to worship God alone with our whole hearts, minds, souls, and bodies. Walk here, not there. Here's the thing I'm learning. For so long in my life, I thought of prayer as something that I did. Say your prayers, we were taught, and this is true. It just isn't the whole truth. And I need the whole truth these days. The wisdom of our tradition isn't just say your prayers. I'm coming to see more and more that the deep wisdom of our tradition teaches us to be your prayers to be them, be a prayer in your whole life. Be a prayer in the way you live, the way you treat people. Be a prayer in the way you care for those in need, for the way you reject hatred, lies, and violence. Be a prayer through the choices you make. Be a prayer by saying no to what needs to have no said to it, and be a prayer by saying yes to what needs to be affirmed. Be a prayer. Don't just say them. Don't just say the words. I'm so tired of folks just saying words, saying so much stuff these days, and then acting as though they're only out for themselves. It's easy to just say things and then go on living your life the way you've always lived it or the way you want to live it without saying no to those things that actually steer us straight into the valley of the shadow of death. If we don't see our Christian faith as a path, as a practice that actually it should change the way we live in the world, if we don't see that, then we're doing it the wrong way, to be blunt. Jesus wasn't shy about telling folks that discipleship costs. Lay down your lives, take up your cross, follow me, he says. 
as followers of Jesus, perhaps we begin to see that our entire lives are meant to be transformed into embodied prayer that bring hope and peace to a struggling world. Amen.